writing the second volume of uh, my book, Melchizedek, uh, Tree of Life Realities, this aspect of inner life has become very important, I think, as a characteristic. So let's pray and uh, let's uh, just open our minds and hearts to God. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you that we can lay down our thoughts, our feelings, our egos, even when we think we're right, and say, Holy Spirit, teach me. Yes. Show me. Open to me. So, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you have anointed me to, to communicate this effectively and unhindered. God, I thank you that we have eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to perceive, and hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There are very different dynamics depending upon our level of awareness of who we are and how that relates to our true identity. But being that this is Black History Month, I thought that I would discuss a dynamic I mentioned in Chapter 12 of the book, which involves two specific slaves prior to the Civil War that rarely get mentioned in the canon of the great leaders. I'll mention both and speak about one. Understand, I don't feel qualified to actually discuss in depth regarding being black in America, Christian or non-Christian, especially regarding their inner mentality about their ancestry experience of slavery. But from a spiritual dynamic for us all, when taken into the context of the New Testament, there is something I think we can all gain. I'm more convinced than ever that because human beings are inner slaves to their serpentine ego, nourishing the mindset of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we oppress and enslave our fellow man, let alone invade countries. From the time of the early church before the New Testament was ever canonized, the new Christian believed in the total victory of Christ for all humanity. Amen. The focus of the church was that Christ redeemed our identity as the image and likeness of God. And in doing that, he gave us an awareness of being part of his kingdom. The challenge is, throughout the last two millennia, the meaning of redemption has changed. The notion of the kingdom of God changed. And that being so, God's image and likeness has come and become somewhat disfigured. Now, I've shared this in the past, that many times our presentation of Christ, Christianity, and the kingdom of God is more like the 1932 painting of a woman with a flower by Pablo Picasso. Yeah. While in the world of art, this is amazing, when it comes to the clarity of our identity in God and our reflection through the kingdom of God to the world around us, it's no wonder we get the response we do. Right. This is not to say that everyone will like Christians. However, based on the predominant degenerating picture of the past thousand years, there has now more than ever appeared a fork in the road. As we shared when we did the book of Revelation, that series that took us literally a year to go through, we have the propensity through our carnality, our egoism, our inner tree of the knowledge of good and evil to become more of the woman of Babylon who rides on the beast of chapter 17 than the one who gives birth to the Christ of chapter 12. There were three specific items mentioned a few minutes ago that is essential to our development and what the early church held dear. This was them. Our redemption, our divine identity, and our awareness of the kingdom of God. We won't be able to discuss all of them in detail today because obviously we have time constraints. So I'm going to focus on one of them particularly, but it will touch on the others. Our redemption. That's, I think, a key thing to understand what that is. When we think of the word redemption, the standard that has been around for more than a half millennia is the following. Now, I literally copied this directly from a Christian website, which will rename nameless. My challenge um, is 
not to point out or finger people, but to bring our awareness to the concepts. So when we hear them, regardless of whom, from whom we do, um, we'll be able to discern the difference between the gospel and what can be a serious misunderstanding of the Christ. Now, I have not changed any of the words here, though I did pick the essential highlights to make the point. I left out their scripture references because some of them were seriously misused. But what I also did was, uh, by leaving out some sections, was simply because we would have been here reading for quite a while. All right. OK, for most of us, what you're about to hear is absolutely nothing new. But I had to draw the line through redemption. The first thing Jesus saves us from is our sins. Sin is any type of wrongdoing. It hurts God and all those whom we wrong. It is the act of transgressing God's commandments. By sinning, we have invoked upon ourselves God's wrath and condemnation. Mm -hmm. Jesus taught that hell is a real place where unrepentant sinners go and that it is eternal punishment. Hell exists because it is God's punishment for breaking his laws and to keep unrighteous people and sin out of his eternal holy kingdom in the life after death. Found that interesting as if sinners are going to storm heaven. Right, right. <laughs> Jesus came to save us not only from our sins, but also the wrath of God. We can try to be justified, declared righteous before God through good works. And this could indeed lower the severity of our punishment because some sins are greater than others, but it will not take away our eternal and just condemnation in hell. So now hell has degrees where there's more pain and less than others. God's anger may be powerful, but it only lasts a moment. I just thought we we're talking about eternal condemnation and hell. How's that last in a moment? Okay. While his favor, on the other hand, lasts for a lifetime. Okay, so your minuscule lifetime compared to the eternity of hell. Right. Do you understand? Yeah. But understand when you're in this logic of thinking, this totally makes sense. Right. Mm -hmm. In this great love for all people, God sent us his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We should not use God's love as a reason for downplaying the severity of sin and God's wrath against sin and sinners. But we should also not use God's wrath and holiness as a reason for downplaying his love and forgiveness. I heard more about wrath, hell, and, 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 and damnation in this than, I, than we did anything else. This is the standard of evangelical Christian doctrine at this time. So with that in mind... Let's talk about our redemption. Yeah. Grasp this. The English word redemption, with its variation, redeemed, redeemer, and, re and redeemed, right? It, right? Redeem, redeemer, redeemed, and redemption. Right. In the entire Bible, which has over 31,102 verses, the verses the word appears in, depending upon translation. Now, I checked the big five, the New King James Version, the NIV, the New International Version, right? The New American Standard Version, the updated edition, the English Standard Version, and the Revised Standard Version. Now, all the verses of the 31,000 plus that uses the word redemption in all its variants is 143. Wow. Which means less than one half of one percent the word the word is mentioned. That doesn't mean it's not important. Taking that further, in the New Testament, where we claim that Jesus is the Redeemer, it's interesting to point out of the 143 times in the entire Bible, the highest number of verses, checking all those translations, okay, is 22 which means over 15, excuse me, which means just over 15%, it's actually 15.385, I did the math, um, 
the word is mentioned. The New American Standard Update Edition, it only appears 17 times, which means it's under 12%. And interestingly, I checked the complete Jewish Bible New Testament, and the word is only used eight times, which is just under 6%. It's an interesting thought, because what many of us think redemption is based on translation, it isn't. Which brings us to this. As we talk about what the early church meant regarding Christ's total victory for mankind and the redemption of our divine identity, it's important then to take the notion of what the word meant in the different Greek texts. Now, the first one is this one. It's olutru. Of the 22 times, it's only used five times and mostly in reference to Israel and Jerusalem two times in reference to Christ. It means the release from an obligation through a purchase. The most common word is apotrusus. Sorry for my Greek friends, I'm mur murdering the Greek language here. It means, in the more general sense, to release. It means the entry into the full inheritance. It refers to redemption of, not redemption from. For example, we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting the adoption, the redemption of the body. It's not talking about what we're being rede redeemed from regarding the body. It's the redemption of the body. And there is a difference. Because that now really brings us to the most common word used in the New Testament. Though not only translated redemption, which is this first word here, which is agorazo, and it also comes in the form of ek agorazo, it means the sacral manumission of slaves. The sacral manumission of slaves taken directly out of the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, abridged edition, 1985, by William Erdemans. It's a translation of what's known as the Kittle and Friedrich New Testament Dictionary. It's a Delphic inscription, way back, a legal form of, listen, self-manumission, whereby the God purchased the, purchases the slave using the slave's own money for the transaction. That's a difference. But that's what it means. Because of how we have degenerated over the last thousand years, starting with the, the, the doctrine of satisfaction, meaning we, we shamed God, okay? And because we shamed God, God sent Jesus to restore his honor. That was the first phase of it. And then we reached good old-fashioned penal substitution and vicarious atonement 500 years ago, which is the standard what we, I just read to you. Okay? But this is what the word means. So with this idea of using the slave's own money for the transaction, we need to rethink some of our verses. Now, while that sounds crazy, think of the paradox, a slave can purchase his own freedom. However, it was possible. In the dark history of American slavery, this was done on several rare occasions. The challenge was that the slave would have to find a way to make money after working all day for his master, which meant little rest. In addition, there was a major risk in attempting to purchase their freedom if the master didn't agree. There would be a high probability that the slave would be treated with more severity for asking. There was also the threat of manumission. Now, that's interesting. In other words, setting a slave free. Believe it or not, that was a threat on occasion. For example, in one of the Arabian night stories where the master says to the slave that he will set him free because he wasn't doing what he was told, the slave responds, quote, please do not free me for I have no craft to gain my living. The setup was clear. Right. And in the South, if you found a black person who was 
in a sense, were on the run, anybody could take that one and murder them. Right. For that matter, for that matter, it's true. The more modern day people, that's us, Okay, know the Aladdin story via Disney featuring Robin Williams and more recently William Smith, uh, Will Smith, where at the end, Aladdin frees the genie. But in the original story dating back somewhere around the 8th or 10th century, the genie isn't freed, but honored to be the slave of his master. It's interesting to point out that when we first translated those works into English in 1706, no one had a problem with that ending. I'm sure there was some, but that was, they didn't have the big voices at the time. Regarding slavery in America, if the master agreed to let the slave purchase his own freedom, in general, it was the master that set the price and the slave had little choice in the matter. There was no bargaining. Well, I'll give you 50 bucks. That, no. In the cases of the two I'm going to refer to today and highlight the one is young James Bradley and Samuel Johnson. This was late in the slave trade era, and when they purchased their freedom, they had to leave the area in which they lived in order not to be confused with a runaway slave. That's difficult to imagine because once a slave purchases freedom, then he had to have enough money to get out of where he was to get where he was going. That would hopefully be a safer place in the North. Of course, there was the complication if he had family, their freedom too had to be purchased. And when it came time to move, then more money was involved. This is a brief story of James Bradley. Born around 1810 in Africa, he was enslaved at a very young age and transported to the United States via Charleston, South Carolina. And before he was purchased, he was purchased by a guy by the name of Mr. Bradley in Kentucky. And that's how he assumed that last name. Shortly after, however, James Bradley, Mr. Bradley, the slave owner, will die but he still stayed on being a slave to those that inherited Mr. Bradley's, how would you call it, business or home life. Now, although he had not been taught of God, he definitely prayed a lot. He longed for liberty and began the laborious effort by working at night to make horse collars by, and by means of growing tobacco and selling it and also selling pigs. All this was to purchase his own freedom, which after eight years, he finally saved enough money. And in 1833, for the sum of just under $700, you can imagine what that was like back in the day, he purchased his own freedom. This is James Bradley's own words concerning this. As soon as I was free, I started for a free state. When I arrived in Cincinnati, I heard of Lane Seminary about two miles out of the city. I had for years been praying to God that my dark mind might see the light of knowledge. I asked for admission into the seminary. They pitied me and granted my request, though I knew nothing of the studies which were required for admission. I am so ignorant that I supposed it would take me two years to get up with the lowest class in the institution. But in all respects, I'm treated just as kindly and just as much like a brother by the students as if my skin were white and my education as good as their own. Thanks to the Lord, prejudice against color does not exist in Lane Seminary. If my life is spared, I shall probably spend several years here and prepare to preach the gospel. Powerful stuff. He's, a, he's unique. A, a lot of those who are enslaved may have been freed later on by other things. But to purchase your own, the manumission of slavery, which is that New Testament word for redemption, he's definitely an example. Now, legal slavery in America started from its inception 
I mean, since the day America started, okay, till 1865 with the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Most of you heard some about that already uh, in our previous weeks here. Keep in mind, slavery has been legally gone for 157 years. That's on the books. But what's on the books doesn't easily erase racism, casteism, and classism because that's part of our inner slavery that our egoistic self-centeredness thrives on, which can only be liberated by us becoming spiritually conscious. Amen. To make the point again, seriously, enslaved people in their inner self usually afflict and enslave others. You could say some of the people that enjoy some of the most lavish meals be people of great power and great influence may be the most enslaved on the inside. Mm -hmm. Now you may be thinking, what are we after by looking into the language of this story as well as the language of the New Testament regarding Christ-centered concepts of this idea of redemption? Let's understand the hermeneutic here. The writers of the New Testament were Hebrew and speaking to a Greco-Roman world. The paganistic view of redemption was not about forgiveness, but about payment. In the same manner, in the Old Testament, when read from the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil paradigm, the same theological dictionary by Kittle and Friedrich state that such a notion of redemption through forgiveness is not an Old Testament concept. Which means that from the view of that tree knowledge of good and evil aspect, the Old Testament sacrifices are no different than pagan ones. That's why it had to come down. Now let's look at one of those verses in a traditional translation from the book of Revelation that we studied a while back. This is chapter 5. This is verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Now, the word purchased, you could easily insert, as other translations do. I'm just using the New International Version because that's one of the most common translations right now. That you purchased, right, with your blood, you redeemed men for God, okay? Now, taking a look at the same verse uh, from the Mirror Translation that fills out some of what these words mean, and they sang a new song, we proclaim your excellent worth. You are the only one in the universe entitled to open the scroll and break its seals since you were slaughtered and sacrificed and in your blood redeemed mankind's authentic identity in God. You rescued them from everything that could possibly define society before and brought them out of the confines of their dwarfed mindsets. This includes the entire spectrum of people groupings, our tribal identities, uh, language specific dialect preferences, our political and religious associations, as well as every form of racial identity. Now, believe it or not, those words are there, but he's filling out, particularly that one for redeemed, um, filling out some of those concepts that are behind those words. Now, understand something before I get any further. For those of you watching, those of you that are here, we at Oasis, including Master Giovanni Ministries and Foundation Rock Ministries, are not looking to be a progressive church. And for that matter, we're definitely not looking at sustaining traditional church and traditional doctrine. Yes. Yes. What we're after is authenticity. Yes. 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 Now, it may include an understanding of traditions and definitely be open and stepping into progressive thinking. Mm -hmm. 
but neither sit on equal footing as the pursuit of authenticity. Amen. In light of the troubling 500-year-old pagan penal substitution doctrine, mostly known as Calvinism, sets a similar standard as the sacros- sacral manumission of slaves, but with a few deviating caveats. In this case, we're slaves to sin, and to be forgiven and loosed from its grip, there is a hefty price to be paid. However, the price is so high, we can't afford it. This is that teaching, okay? This is where the doctrine tells us the sacrifice of Jesus comes into the picture. It says that he, quote unquote, paid the price for our forgiveness, resulting in our freedom. The first deviating caveat is the misuse of the word forgiveness. Forgiveness cannot be bought or sold. This notion is what's known as antinomic. Forgiveness, again, cannot be bought and sold. Forgiveness is a willful choice to release someone from any wrong or obligation. Payment is irrelevant. On the other hand, if we were to properly state that doctrine without the facade of forgiveness, it would be that Jesus was the payment for our freedom. Forgiveness was irrelevant. A life for a life very much a Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy approach, right? Right. However, because of our status of sin, our life wasn't worthy enough. Thus, the reason his ransom, excuse me, the reason his ransom was more valuable was that he was sinless. The bottom line, his life was worth more than ours. The notion is anything but the gospel there. The only real difference between Jesus as a human and us is that he understood his identity. That didn't make us less. That just revealed our unconsciousness because of our egocentered view of the knowledge of good and evil, which is a fancy way of saying that we were still asleep in the light, to quote the famous song by Keith Green. Based on the divergent doctrine, if you will, or teaching of the last 500 years or more, if Jesus was paying the price for our freedom rather than a true sacral manumission of slavery, the question asked has to be asked, who's getting paid? Is it God? Then this is not about love, but a good legal business transaction satisfying some form of divine justice that even God is obligated to pay. From the serpentine view of the tree knowledge of good and evil, this makes total sense. But to ask the question again, and we'll go down a list here. Interesting. Who's re- who required the payment? Who established the price? Why couldn't it be just forgiven? From whose account is it withdrawn and into whose account is it deposited? But honestly, the other flavor is so attractive to, if you will, the flesh. That we just go for it. Listen to some of the worship songs that we hear in churches at times. Listen to some of the things that are said from pulpits at times. I'm not saying people are not christian or don't have jesus in their heart or any of those things i'm just talking about the mentality and how we are affected and what it gives permission into our lives and for that matter what it gives us sometimes permission to do the other to do to others in our lives think of it if the penalty of a person's sin is a thousand dollars and that person's father decides to pay the debt to whom does he pay it If their father has a bank account with $2,000 in it and pays their debt, his account is depleted by $1,000. Where did the money go? Who received the penalty payment? In that scenario, clearly it wasn't the father. He paid it from his personal account. Nor was it the child. He or she was the one who owed the $1,000. 
technically they were the ones in debt. So who is this phantom to whom the debt is owed? And for that matter, to whom is it paid? We mask all this by saying, without answering those questions, this is what the love of God looks like. He was willing to pay their penalty at his expense. Really? But once again, to whom? The problem with this non-New Testament, non-Christ-centered logic begs the question, who was the master that established the price and demanded payment? Was it some external devil living on the other side of the spiritual world in a place named hell? Or some other dark place in the heavenlies on planet Earth? If so, why would God pay the devil? Right, exactly. <laughs> why not God just being God, demand mankind's freedom. I mean, technically, the Israelites were slaves of Pharaoh for almost 400 years since the death of Joseph to the time of Moses. Right. And prior to that, they were there for 430, but that, fir that first 30 years, that's when Joseph was around, so they weren't, quote, slaves yet. Right. So when the time came for their liberation, we don't see Moses paying some huge sum of money to Pharaoh mm -hmm. or gives Pharaoh some other kind of ransom. God didn't see the slavery of the children of Israel to Egypt as a valid contract, obligation, or liability. So with God's decree, they just left. Yeah. When Pharaoh came after them, from that famous scene of the Ten Commandments, when Pharaoh came after them, there was no negotiating or brokering a transaction. They tried to cross into the Red Sea, a symbol of migrating from sleep to consciousness. The Egyptians couldn't do it, and they drowned. In other words, Mitzrayim, which is Hebrew for Egypt, means imprisonment. Mm -hmm. Our inner imprisonment can't go where a freed heart and mind can. Our inner imprisonment can't go where a freed heart and mind can can. A quick answer for some is that a sovereign justice had to be satisfied by payment for sin. So then, who created the justice system and why? If we're still holding on to the notion that the devil has us in legal bondage, how many of you said we've heard that over and over again? then we have to figure that God created the legal system that he's capitalizing on. Mm -hmm. If it was the devil that created it, then there would be no more valid of a contract than with Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Surely God isn't obligated to live by any of the devil's rules. Even if he had some, right? right. On the other hand, if God created the legal system that had to be paid, then we're back to an old riddle. Can God make a rock so big that he himself can't lift it? The answer to the penal substitution doctrine is yes, someone has to pay, even if it means God. Wow. <laughs> Calling it like it is. On the other hand, the compassion revealed through Jesus on the cross is a revelation of what God, Father, Son, and Spirit, actually looks like. Christ crucified is not at odds with a wrathful Father, no. nor a Father that's at odds with humanity, nor is Christ paying off the Father or some external devil for a bounty to liberate mankind from a cavernous debt. To the contrary, Christ on the cross displays what the image and likeness of God in humanity looks like. In that moment, Christ redeemed, keep in mind how we're going to use this word now, redeemed, purchased back with his own blood at his own cost, in other words, what the likeness of God looks like in mankind. From whom did he redeem it? A wrathful father, a dark evil sp spirit called Satan? No. 
as Jesus told his disciples privately. Notice these verses and how they are worded. We read them all the time. Matthew 13, 45 through 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and bought it. Do you notice it doesn't say anything about anybody else buying it for him? The Greek word phrase there is the, that and bought it is the exact same word as in Revelation the sacral manumission of slaves. Bought it with his own currency. How about this verse? Famous one. Matthew 25, 6 through 9. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. I find it amazing how we, because a lot of it has to do with translation, knowing what words mean, how we, we, we it's, all, it's always been there. But because of our continual barrage of what we've known over the last 500 years or so, we really don't hear what's being said here. We just figured five were smart, five were, five were dumb. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And the other guy found something really great and went for it. Matthew, in his writing, telling us what... Jesus said in these parables, uses again the same word in Revelation 5, 9 for redeem. But notice the context. As the word describes, we see the manumission of slavery and the person using their own currency for freedom with God overseeing the transaction. Four, the one who found the kingdom. It was likened unto him who found a pearl of great price. He left where he was. Sold, literally exchanged is the Greek word there, what he had and bought with his own money the pearl. Right. In other words, his, pur his purchased, excuse me, in other words, he purchased his portion of the kingdom of God with his own money. It didn't say the devil was paid off or a wrathful God or some other being. Rather, the person himself left the world he was living in, sold or literally exchanged what he had. Matter of fact, what he had gained even in that world, exchanged whatever he gained there and acquired for himself the kingdom of God. Think of that. Think of that. We'll answer it after we look at the next verse, if there's a question. In the parable of the ten virgins, and this, by the way, is lifted right out of the Melchizedek book I'm writing right now. In the parable of the ten virgins, again, the same word is used. However, this time it's more emphatic and begins with, then all the virgins woke up. We gained, gained a measure of consciousness. This is about entering into, when I use the word conscious, you want to use more of a biblical term, the mind of Christ. How God thinks. Spiritual consciousness. Here we see two kinds of stirring. The first rise and trim their lamps. How? I think it's clear by the parable's implication they bought for themselves sufficient oil to stay awake in the world of the bridegroom. The second group momentarily stir, but in effect roll over and go back to sleep. 
they didn't have enough for themselves to stay awake in the world of the bridegroom. When they asked the first group of virgins for some oil, the wise ones responded, buy some for yourself. If we were to use the translation as in Revelation, it would actually be redeem some for yourself. The first group, those wise virgins, weren't being nasty. Okay, they were not, it wasn't like they're unwilling to share. They weren't being very Christian. No, the point is this. They were letting us know how to stay awake or stay conscious in the light. Staying awake to divine reality, the mind of Christ, a consciousness in the world above, isn't something you can simply give to another, like a book or a video or even a Bible. This is about when the awakening occurs, humbling oneself away. Remember the first guy left? Away from the world below. Letting go of our fabricated beliefs about ourselves, God, and reality, and allowing ourselves to stay consistent in the new mindset, or better said, part set. By leaving the world of egoism, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, all that, and embracing our true self through compassion, the love of God, we will always have enough oil to sustain the divine light. At the cross and in the resurrection, Jesus showed us how to redeem our portion of the kingdom of God. He wasn't paying Satan or some huge debt that roused God's vengeance. More accurately, he redeemed it from a demigod, if you want to use it in those terms, a ruler of hell, an egoistic demon of sorts made in his image and likeness called mankind. He restored and revealed who we were created to be, who we are in divine reality, and in whose image and likeness we were fashioned. This is the manumission of our slavery, as truly described. Jesus showed us while on the cross a mirror reflecting to us what we look like in two forms. In one reflection, we see our egoistic satanic cruelty how were the demonic forces, the devils of torment and affliction? We see how we impinged violence upon divine innocence, making the revelation of God in Christ our scapegoat and joying in our wrath as we did. So easy to, buy, to sidestep and say, oh, well, the devil out there right. used them. Right. We vindicate ourselves. Because, of course, we weren't there. And then, of course, then it begs the question, you know, well, yeah, but he died for your sin. So, yeah, you kind of were, especially even if you do the penal substitution thing. I mean, it, get, it unravels very quickly. However, more so, another greater reflection. What the non-shattered, uncompromised likeness of God looks like in human form. Jesus, as the divine image, didn't trade it to survive the crucifixion or broker a transaction to avoid what we, the Satan, had in store for him. He preserved his divine identity, which is also the divine paradigm of ours. Despite the torture, beatings, and violent death, the darkness of the grave, followed by a resurrective reemergence from it, he showed us who we are in divine form. Jesus didn't redeem us through pagan penal substitution or us vicariously imaging his death as ours. He preserved our true identity, which was and is always within us. In other words, he revealed to us that we always had the currency within to be liberated. Amen. 
just like Abraham, who believed what God said about him and it was accounted as righteousness, meaning intertwined in his thinking that he was walking the path in union with God, we too can open our inner eyes through humility and compassion, cognizant of what God said about us from the beginning. And we can take that to the proverbial bank, accounting it and intertwining it in our thinking, revealing the path to the tree of life. We've transmigrated from the world below to the world above, resting in the grace and truth revealed through Christ. In the resurrection, Christ showed us that everything we, the Satan, crucified him over was completely undone. All the reasons why Jesus should die politically, religiously, socially, and morally were undone. Any of our rationalizations, personal or corporate, were all undone. Like the strong religious rationalizations personified in Caiaphas, the high priest, who attempted to preserve what was left of his nation and the illusion of freedom by condemning Jesus was all undone. Or like Pilate, who tried to govern by keeping the peace, trying to satisfy everyone by giving the people what they wanted, washing his hands of the liability of Christ's death by saying, you see to it. Guess what? All undone. Or, and this one's kind of important, Simon of Cyrene, who through fear and complacency of all the above mentioned, carried the cross, the instrument of Christ's death, to the place of execution. Even that's undone. It's important to point out, by the way, that in every account where Simon of Cyrene is mentioned, it always has the definition of the place of the cross. Golgotha, the place of the skull. Every time. In other words, all these rationalizations in their many justifications, images, and forms have the propensity in our minds to crucify our divine identity as revealed in Christ. All of them. Even complacency. Good news? Through humility and compassion, which passes all realizations, or to sound more King James New Testament, passes all understanding, are all undone. Christ embodied what God and mankind looks like in life, death, and resurrection. Hence, it is finished. The reason why I had that, for you can't see it now, up at the top, wearing handcuffs mm -hmm. with their own key, or this one with the key, mm -hmm. we've always had the key. We always were, in the eyes of God, his image and likeness. It was us that chose to believe something different. And that belief is what enslaved us. Consequently, the only thing that stands in our way of realizing this truth is the same delusional, egoistic belief that tells us we're not like God enough and we have to do all these different things to attain it. God reconciled us to Christ himself by telling us, you are forgiven at the crucifixion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not about payment. I forgive you right. you're, for what you're doing to me right now. Right. Not about the, all the laws and all the sacrifice, all that stuff. I mean, I talk about this in the book too and go through some logic of it. Think about it. Because there's a verse in Romans that says all the previous sins were, were left unpunished. So I, thought, so I said, so if they were left unpunished, why all the sacrificial animals? Jesus forgives us on the cross and at the resurrection says, peace be unto you. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm not at war with you guys. Yes. I wasn't then. Never 
I took all the punches. I mean, talk about turning the other cheek. He did way more than that in the cross. That's a lot bigger than a cheek. In other words, my compassion displayed at the crucifixion undoes everything that anyone did to put me there. The ultimate point of it all is I'm showing you who you are. You are just like me. You are compassion, an incarnation of the nature of God. You may now uncover, release yourself from the prison of the serpentine tree and live in your identity from the world above. The subsequent verse in Revelation chapter 5, where the manumission of slaves is mentioned, says this. And you have made them unto God a realm of royalty to reign upon the earth as priests. Wow. In other words, just like Christ Jesus, we can live from our divine identity from the world above while we are here in the world below. From our perspective, listen, it's God's intention that we are his likeness. From God's perspective, it's his intention that he's the likeness of mankind. Christ's incarnation is the union of those intentions as one. We're now that Christ-like incarnation, the union of those intentions. God and man, man and God, the living temple complete. We should honor Jesus for his position in the kingdom, but not because he's greater or more of value. If we do, we devalue ourselves from his intention and do not understand what redemption means. How many times have we heard preachers correctly say, it's interesting because it all gets all mixed in. How many of you heard them correctly say things like, you have a golden chest in the spirit full of everything you need. The problem is we're unaware that it was always there and that we had the key. But one of the reasons uh, we have trouble using the key, believe it or not, is because of that divergent doctrine. We're not worthy enough. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to say, well, Jesus bought it for you. He gave it to you, but you're not activating it. You're not using it. Right. Why do you think that? Because we got this other talk going on. You've always had the key. What Jesus did on the cross is show you how to use it. It wasn't he used it for you and then he dumped the box on you. That would make it a whole lot easier. But then I'm not being like him. I'm being less than. As Jesus said, I no longer, John 15, call you slaves or servants, I call you friends. <sighs> Again, one of the reasons why we have trouble using the key is because of these divergent teachings about substitution and vicarious atonement, which is a complete misuse of the word atonement. We've done teaching on that before. We won't do it now. I'll just oversimplify it real fast. Atonement has nothing to do with paying for sin. Atonement is an English word that comes out of the Latin, which means at one mint. Something to think about. Not to set back at one moment. At one moment, and as a matter of fact, for every, the only times that word is used is in Ephesians. Um, as one of the places. I think there's one other place. It never appears in the Gospels in that way. And for example, it talks us about being one body. Right. At one moment. Okay? Right. Had nothing to do with paying for anything. Right. You always had the golden chest and the key. And what Jesus showed us is that you are worthy to open it, despite your beliefs about yourself. And for that matter, he showed us how. Remember those verses, things like, if you just take up your cross and follow me. Get rid of that egoistic self. Get rid of that knowledge of good and evil mess and judgmentalism. Because let's put it this way, honestly, people, we cannot judge somebody else without judging ourselves. You can't. You can't have a free of judge. If you are free of judgment for yourself and you judge others, there's something psychologically wrong there. It doesn't work at that point. There's a bit of a sociopath present. I'm not kidding. Let me conclude with this thought from a prophetic word 
Jesus was supposed to be speaking from back in 1977 by a lady by the name of Helen Schuchman. Equal should not be in awe of one another because awe implies inequality. It is therefore an inappropriate reaction to me. An elder brother is entitled to respect for his greater experience and obedience for his greater wisdom. He is also entitled to love because he's a brother and to devotion if he's devoted. Why is Jesus worthy of our devo devotion? Because he was devoted to, to us and still is. Understand? Okay. It's only my devotion that entitles me to yours. There is nothing about me that you can't attain. I have nothing that does not come from God. The difference between us now is that I have nothing else. <laughs> this leaves me in a state which is only potential for you. Powerful stuff. Something to think about. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life... He wasn't saying, bow and worship me, because if you don't, judgment is coming. Or that he was of more value, therefore follow, follow him. No. Rather, he was saying, to use the mirror translation a bit here, John 14, 6, my I amness, mirrored in you, is your way, is your truth, and is your life. Every single person is now brought face to face with the Father entirely because of my doing. Jesus showed you how. He showed you, you. It changes redemption. It changes how we use some of these words and maybe some of the concepts. Go back and reread your New Testament, realizing we always had the currency. Jesus showed us how to use it. And many times when it talks about purchasing or buying, it's the sacral manumission of slaves, not a transaction God is making because he's really angry, which really doesn't make sense. I mean, think about that. If, if this is God, so I'm God, you owe me, so I'm going to pay me. Why bother? <laughs> I'm God, omnipotent creator of all things. And there's this little limpy devil that we've created out there, you know, with red shorts on. And he's got everybody in bondage. I'm going to pay him off. I was about to make a comment, but I won't until the camera's over. <laughs> until we're over on that. Jesus showed us what we look like. You've always had the key. You've always been the image and likeness of God. You've always been equal to Christ. He's the firstborn among many brethren. Yes. Spirit. Same plane. Amen. Doesn't matter your background. Doesn't matter your color, race, caste system. We can go down a list of stuff. You are the image and likeness of God. And we have, if you will, a golden chest with everything we need from wisdom to what we need to get through life. Most importantly, in here. I'm not talking about bank accounts outside because some of us need different things. But I am talking about values in here. Values about ourselves and others that we can open the key to and probably give the greatest gift we can give to somebody else is the jewel that we have to truly become conscious of, that we're in his image. And share that with somebody else. God bless you. Let's have a quick prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you that we are your image and likeness. You created us like you. And you want to live life through us. Blows my mind. And not just here on planet Earth, but in the worlds to come as it concludes in Revelation. Thank you, God. Lord, elevate our consciousness now. Elevate us, Lord. Help us when we start to stir and awake and realize for those brief moments we don't feel guilty or feel unworthy or feel like, no, I, I, no, somebody else had to do this for me rather than, no, somebody else had to show me. 
big difference because it's about image and likeness. Father, thank you. When we feel that way, God, help us stir. Help us awaken. I bet you if those foolish virgins just went and bought oil, Mm -hmm. they would have been ready. In Jesus' name, have a spectacular day and continue to lift up what's happening. Hi, I'm Pastor Karen of Oasis of the Valley, and I'm here with Pastor Christine and Dr. John, and we'd like to share something with you. If you don't live in the local area and you'd like to be part of our Oasis Fellowship, we've got a way to connect. We'd like to get to know you personally by video conference calls and telephone calls, and Dr. John will tell you more about how that came about. It was just a few weeks ago, in literally one week's time, I got several emails from people in different parts of the United States and even overseas who are interested in finding a church in their area that's preaching the same powerful message that we are and in the way we are that's quite unique. And unfortunately, I couldn't give them really an answer. I know of a couple of churches and friends that are are ministering like this, but honest, there's not too many. And we are truly trying to press forward into a whole new arena in God right now. And uh, what wound up happening was that the thought occurred to me, well, we've got all this amazing technology. Why can't we pastor them with the video conferencing and stuff that you were talking about and minister into their life? And who knows what God will be able to do through that. With enough people, we may be able to start a church out there. Sounds good. So if you're interested, please click the link below and we'll explain more.